Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful.
something, there's something, there's something, something about your name, there's something, there's something, there's something, something about your name. continue with the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to start reading at verse number 19 and go to the end of verse 24. It says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Therefore, the light that is in you is darkness. How great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So as we continue on with the Sermon on the Mount, just a very quick summary. I've gone through these slides many times in the last couple of months. We talked about salt and light and how we are to be salt and light and how that is an influence to the people around us. We talked about how our life is a book that people read and they read the pages of our book and see how we behave and what we say. We're living in a decayed and decaying world. We're living in a dark and ever darkening world. We know that. The purpose of light is to illuminate and light and darkness cannot inhabit the same place. We talked about the Beatitudes and how the first four have to do with the inner man and the second four with the outer. We talked about light one Sunday and how God is light and His Word is light and how Jesus Christ is light. We talked about good works and how they're not meant to glorify us. They're not meant to bring attention to us. They're meant to glorify our Father in heaven. We talked about what it means to be a Christian, not just in name, because that's easy. It's easy to say I'm a Christian, but it's harder to act like one and behave like one and what that really means. We talked about how Jesus Christ didn't come to abolish or to condemn the law, but actually to fulfill the law. We talked about attitude, and of course that's my favorite saying, that attitude is everything. Six different things that Jesus spoke to in regards to behavior. Uh, you shall not commit murder. And he talked about how it doesn't, it's not only the physical act of these six things, but it's actually what goes on in the mind and the motives. So you shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. He talked about divorce and how, how God's intention for it was. He talked about making oaths, which is being men and women of our word. <coughs> talked about loving your enemies and not just loving your enemies, but blessing those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And a couple of weeks ago, we had prayer for the persecution that we're experiencing as believers today. And I believe that God answers prayer at all times. We talked about going the extra mile. We talked about avoiding hypocrisy and not living one way one day on Sunday and then living another way the rest of the week. Which brings us to today and the Scripture that we've read already. You know, there's an awful lot of treasure seeking going on in the world today. And you don't have to look even as far as television 
and all the, the infomercials that, that come on, and even the commercials. People are trying to make money. They're trying to, to sell things and get you to buy them, and so there's a lot of treasure seeking going on. You can certainly see it on television. You can see it on the internet. You ever get internet spam on your computer where uh, all these advertisements start showing up to get you to buy their product and so on and so forth? A number of years ago, I saw an ad in the paper. And it said this, make money at home stuffing envelopes. And so I thought, well, maybe that might be a good idea to make a bit of extra cash. It said, send a self-addressed stamped envelope with $10. I thought, well, $10 isn't bad. Send a self-addressed stamped envelope with $10 to such and such a box in such and such a place. And you will receive promptly your envelope stuffing kit. Ten bucks. So I took a $10 bill, I put it in an envelope, I sent it off. And what I got back in the mail was a piece of paper. It had my writing on it because I sent them the self-addressed stamped envelope. I even paid for them to send me the kit. And on that piece of paper it said, find a community between 10 and 20,000 people in your country. And find a newspaper that is published in that community. And then take out a small, you're going to have to pay for the article, but you take out a small little article and this is what you write in the article. Make money at home stuffing envelopes. <laughs> if interested, send $10 and then make a P.O. box for yourself. And you'll see the $10 bill start rolling in. Interesting, isn't it? I don't know if you've ever seen that little article that appears, but I watch for it sometimes. Even when I watch for it in our local newspaper, I haven't seen it. But if you ever see a little article that says, make money stuffing envelopes, don't send them the $10. <laughs> because it's a scheme. Of course, there's these places of, of business where people gather around to buy lottery tickets and scratch and scratch. You know, sometimes if you're in Walmart, the McDonald's area there where all the tables are, you'll see people there and they'll have just a stack of, of scratch cards that have obviously won nothing. And it, it gets on my nerves a little bit when you go to a gas station and you have two people in front of you. And it's fine if they're there to pay for their gas or to get a, a bottle of pop or, or whatever. But when they're looking and, uh, let me see, I'll, I'll take one of those. And, uh, and then they give a whole bunch of things and they scan them through the machine and you're standing there and you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. There are even people who treasure seek when other people die. When suddenly someone is in their last days. It's interesting and I've, I've seen it happen because as a pastor sometimes you're involved with families as, as a loved one is about to pass away and, and suddenly distant relatives show up out of the woodwork and they're expecting possibly that, oh, maybe if I show up in the last few days I might get something out of their will or out of their estate because they're treasure seekers. There's a show that comes on TV on Sunday nights called The Curse of Oak Island. and For hundreds of years, people have been searching for treasure on this island. They, you know, they, they have a place called a money pit where they've apparently found some money and, and they're doing research into all the different possibilities of, of these boats traveling over from Europe and possibly depositing and burying with, with uh, traps to prevent people from finding them. And Interestingly enough, this is Oak Island. When we were living in Nova Scotia, we lived right near Oak Island. In fact, this is the causeway leading onto the island. I've been on Oak Island before. And if you drive off of this causeway, and down here, this brings you out to highway number three, 
and then you go this way a little bit, and New Hope Community Church is on the mainland right here. And so we could uh, we heard lots about Oak Island when we lived there. I, I was on the island, but it's amazing the what people are going through. There's people that have died looking for this treasure, and they are definitely treasure seekers. And there's many ways to treasure seek. But you know, treasure seeking, it all points to an attitude of the heart. And the attitude of the heart when you're treasure seeking is this. Is that you're looking out for number one. And there's a chant that sometimes people will use and they'll raise their hands and say, we're number one, we're number one. And it's a competitive chant, and, and sports teams use it, and, and, and businesses use it, and, and, and even countries, like our neighbors to the south, use it. Make America great again, which is basically saying we're number one. And you know, each time it's used, a competition will ensue between two or more groups of people. And so it's understandable if you have two sports teams that one team wants to win and the other team wants to win and they both think that they're the best and so they'll compete against each other and, and businesses will, you know the flyers that you get on Wednesday? And you get the flyers for No Frills, you get the, fri- the flyers for, for Walmart, you get it for Metro, for all the stores. It's because they all want to be number one. They all want to show you that they have the best savings, that they have the best options, that they have the best store and it's a competition. Cable and satellite companies do it as well. And, and we have Shaw Direct, which used to be Star Choice. We get phone calls all the time from Bell Express View asking if we want to switch and what is, the, what is the price you're paying for Shaw because we'll do better and we'll give you more channels. It, it's a competition because they want to be number one. Car companies do the same thing. They will say, well, this car company will give you these options on this car, but we're going to give you these and we're going to give them to you for free because they want to be number one. And Cell phones. There's almost nobody goes without a cell phone these days. And as soon as you buy one, someone else is coming out with a better model and someone else is coming out with a better plan. And the promotion is unbelievable because they want to be number one. And even churches at times can use similar concepts and methods to promote themselves. I was in a church in Nova Scotia one time. And of course, when you walk into the church, you get a bulletin like you do here. And on the front of the bulletin had a picture of the church and it had this written above the picture of the church. It said, the difference is worth the drive. The difference is worth the drive. And as you analyze that statement just a little bit more, you realize that what they're saying is, if you drive past all of these other churches and come to ours, then you will find that there's a difference. It's not exactly saying we're number one, but it's close. Because it's a mindset that our culture has. You see, the end result of treasure seeking usually is conflict or war or dispute of some sort. And it doesn't have to do with bombs, but it has to do with words. And how many of us realize that words can have a tremendous effect on people? In a good way, if you encourage someone, if you pray for them, if you even just smile and say, hello, so nice to see you. It has a positive effect. But you, you look at somebody the wrong way and you, say, uh, you whisper about someone or you, you say something discouraging and, and boy, it, it can have a devastating effect. Words can be just as destructive as anything else. And when we use this chant as individuals, we're number one, we're number one. It reflects that our attitude is that we're number one. It reflects that our desire is that we're number one. It reflects that our priorities, according to us, are number one. But here's the thing. When we want to be number one, it immediately puts us in conflict with God. Because God is number one. He always has been and He always will be. And so you see, our ego, our pride, 
is really at the root of our priorities. Because whatever it is that we want to do is usually what we end up doing. Isn't that right? If you want to do something, and if you want it bad enough, you will find yourself eventually participating or behaving in that way. And the reason why that happens is because of human nature. Human nature makes it hard for us to put anything else ahead of our own desires, ahead of our own priorities. And here's why. You see, it's, it's because society tells us that we are the most important. And children are told from a very young age, you can do anything that you want. You can be anything that you want to be. Even to the point in our society right now where young children are being told, hey, if you're born a boy but you want to be a girl, go for it. Because you can be whatever you want to be. And if you're born a girl and you want to be a boy, go for it. Set your own priorities. Do whatever you want, whatever you think is right. Our society is feeding that lie to us. And it doesn't come from society. It comes from the enemy. It really does. And you know, even Christians can be found putting many things ahead of God. You see, because when we give in to the lies of the enemy, he will tell us that you need more of something. Or he'll tell us that you need less of something. And when we want more time in our lives, we'll, we'll stop praying. When we want more money in our lives, we'll stop giving. And sometimes we'll stop giving to God. If people want less conviction, they'll stop reading His Word. If people want less conviction, they, they will sometimes stop going to church. You see, because human nature will cause us to end up doing what we want to do instead of what we need. And how much do we realize that sometimes what we need is the more difficult of the two? What we want isn't always the best thing for us. And if we always do what we want, many times we will end up doing the wrong thing. And so, if we look to the Word of God, we understand that Paul struggled with this. Paul the Apostle in Romans chapter 7, verse 19, he says this, For the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil... I will not to do that I practice. In other words, the, the things that I know are good and I, I know I should be doing, I back away from them. But the things that are evil and I, I know I shouldn't be doing, Paul said those are the things I end up practicing. Those are the things I end up doing. So, so Paul struggled with it. It's not something new in our culture and our society today. It goes right back to biblical times. And look what Paul says in the very next verse. He says, now if I do what I will not to do, in other words, if I do the wrong thing, it is no longer I that do it, or I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Our desire should never be that sin dwells within us. We should desire that the Holy Spirit dwells within us. We should desire that the Word of God dwells within us. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I will not sin against, he, against thee. So our desire shouldn't be that sin be there, but our desire should be that the Holy Spirit be there, that the Word of God be there. So the question we need to be asking ourselves is this. What's number one in my life right now? When you're coming to a point in your life where you're you're setting priorities, and that really needs to be done over and over again, repeatedly. Whether it's every week or every month or every year, we need to look at our lives and look at our behavior and look at our time and look at our resources and look at what we have and say, okay, Lord, help me to put these in order according to You. So what is it that's number one in your life right now? Is it you? Is it your family? 
Is it your job? And, and, and keep in mind that these things are not necessarily bad things. Is it money that's number one? Is it possessions that's number one? Is it your ego that's number one? Is it Jesus Christ that's number one? Ask yourselves these questions. And be honest with yourself in the replies that you give. So, ask yourself this. What is it that dominates my thoughts? What is it that I'm thinking about most often? What is it that dominates my ambitions? What is it that dominates my dreams? What is it that dominates the decisions I make concerning my finances? What is it that dominates my time? What do you find yourself doing the most of? What is it that dominates your actions? What is it that dominates, as we were talking about this morning, your priorities? Think about those for a moment. What is it that dominates all those things in your life? And then ask yourself this question. Is it what Christ wants there? Or is it what I want there? That answer will help you to determine where your priorities lie. There's a poem by a man by the name of Robert Frost. And the poem is called The Road Not Taken. And as I read through this short portion of, of this poem, Understand this, that it's not, he's not, the author's just not talking about a, a little walk in the woods where he has two paths that he's given a choice to make. It, it's something much deeper than that. And, and here's what Robert Frost writes. I shall be telling you this with a sigh. Somewhere ages and ages hence, Two roads diverged in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by. And that has made all the difference. You see, when we're faced with roads in our lives, when we're faced with a fork in the road where we have to make a choice whether we do this or do that, whether we say this or whether we say that, we need to set our priorities in such a place where God helps us to make the decision on which path to take. And sometimes the path that God will call us to take will be the one that nobody else is taking. Maybe it'll be the one that's a little bit more difficult. Maybe it'll be the one that's a little bit longer. Maybe it's the one that's a little bit less familiar. The author is speaking about the choices that we make or the paths that we make and the priorities that we set in our lives. And here's what choosing a path actually symbolizes. Choosing a path or a road, making a choice in life, is any choice that we must make between two or more things. And both or, or multiple things, they can all be equally attractive. We may all, we may want to head on each one of those paths that we may have no problem with any of them. And they may be important to us. But we need to understand that each path that we take will always lead us to a different de a destination. Some paths the enemy will put in, our, in front of us, and when we take them, they will lead us to destruction. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will put a path in front of us and it may be very narrow, it may be very hard, but it will lead us to everlasting life and joy and peace. There needs to be discernment. And it all has to do with where your priorities are. See, because the path that you choose will always reflect your priorities. And if you remember nothing else from today, let's think about this statement. Our values, our morals, what we consider to be number one is always revealed in the choices that we make in our Christian walk. You can immediately tell what kind of spiritual walk a person has by the choices that they make that are seen. 
And Christ conveys this very clearly. This this exact thought in our text today. Here's what He says in verse 21. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Whatever path that you choose, your heart is going to follow it. And whatever path you choose is what you deem your treasure is. And so if you go to whatever it is that you want, whatever you treasure, you may find yourself on the wrong path. Because where your treasure is, your heart will follow. Whatever treasure seeking you're doing, your heart is going to be there because it's important to you. Some people take this Scripture verse and they twist it around and say, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. That's not how it works. Your treasure doesn't come to you. Your heart goes to whatever it is you treasure. And so it all depends on the choices that you make. Whatever you value the most in your life, that is your number one. Oprah gave a a speech at one of the award shows a few weeks ago and said, whatever your personal truth is, you go in that direction. Certain amount of truth to that, but I'd prefer to say it this way. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Because that comes from the Word of God. And it tells us how we're wired. In Joshua chapter 24, verse 15, when the children of God hesitated at a very confusing crossroad spiritually, Joshua challenged them to make a choice and says this, Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Plaque above my parents' bed that I remember ever since I was a little children was this Scripture verse. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It doesn't matter what everybody else chooses. It doesn't matter how many options are out there. Whatever they choose is their decision. Whatever path they take is their choice. But as for me, as Joshua challenged the children of God, choose yourselves this day who it is that you're going to serve. Choose which path that you're going to take. Choose the priorities that you're going to set in your life. See, because Joshua knew that service and commitment could not be rendered to two masters. I want you to imagine this for a moment. Let's say you had a job and that job required you to work 40 hours a week. But let's say that you wanted to have another job. And that job required that you work 40 hours a week. What do you think would happen? Because nobody can work 80 hours a week, or at least you shouldn't. (laughs) It's a lot of work. What would happen if a man or a woman called in sick every other day? So let's say that I'm delivering for Domino's, but I also want to deliver for Caesars, Little Caesars. Okay, Peter, here's your schedule for Domino's. Here's your schedule for Little Caesars. What would happen if Monday I went to Domino's and then Tuesday I called, oh, I can't make it in, Domino's. I can't make it in today. I'll be in tomorrow. And then went to work at Little Caesars. And then the next day I called in, oh, Little Caesars, I just can't make it in. I'm so sick and, and back and forth. What would happen if your loyalty was divided in that way? What would happen with your employers? Would you have any job? You'd get fired from both and you'd be left with nothing. And it's the same with anything that we are called to be loyal to. It's the same with anything that we are called to be committed to, whether it's a job or a relationship or our time or our service to God or our finances. Our loyalty is designed to lean in one direction or the other but not be split. And Jesus conveyed this exact thought in the Scripture that we read this morning. He said, No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot. doesn't say you should not. doesn't say you might not. 
It says you cannot serve God and mammon. Now, mammon is a reference to money, but it's not just talking about money here. It's talking about anything that takes the place of God. Anything that shifts into our list of priorities and pushes God down. That's mammon. It's anything that can be worshipped and that puts God in second place. I've heard people say the strangest things. You know that TV show years ago? The kids say the strangest things. Well, I've heard people say the strangest things to avoid putting God first in their lives. It's amazing how people will come to a pastor and say, Pastor, I need your advice. I need your your input. And, And they say things that really they just, they amaze me. That they're trying to find some kind of justification or way to disobey. I think I shared this story with you a little while ago. This woman came to me when I was a youth pastor in in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. And her husband was on the board, and I, I probably think that he was not aware of this little meeting. But she comes into my office with her daughter. And her daughter is 19 years old. And she sits there and she tries to convince me and say, you know, Pastor, when you, when you buy a car, you want to take it for a test drive, right? When you buy a house, you want to get inspectors to come in and you want to, 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 to try it out and you want to see that everything's in the right place. And so shouldn't it be the same with relationships? And, and she actually... I was quite appalled when she pointed over to her daughter, don't you think by the same standards it's okay that my daughter live with her boyfriend for a while? People say the strangest things. And and they say the strangest things because their priorities are not in the right place. I've heard people come to me and say, Pastor, I I just I can't come to church because so and so is sitting there. So and so is sitting over on the other side and I know that if I go to church, I'm just going to sit there and I'm going to stew the whole time. So it's just better that I don't go. Isn't that right, Pastor? It tells me the priority is not about forgiveness and reconciliation, but about holding grudges and bitterness. Priorities. I've had people come to me and other pastors alike. Pastor, I just can't afford to tithe because... You see, I have, I have so many expenses and I have debt and God would want me to be responsible and pay off all my debt, right? So, I'm sorry, but I, I can't give to the church because I have these other responsibilities and God wants to me, me to be a good steward. People say the strangest things. In that same church in Bridgewater, the pastor brought me in for a meeting. I was, I, was his, I was the youth pastor. and He says, I want you to come sit in on this meeting. And, and as a young pastor, we were learning things. And this woman comes in and, and the pastor, he was trying to help her with her, her budgeting, her finances. Because she was asking the church for some money. And so the, the pastor said, well, let's look at your finances and see if we can help you streamline things so that you will have what you need. And so she brought in all of her receipts and all of her bank statements and, and he said, okay, so you have your phone bill and you have your power and you have your rent and you have all of these things. And she brought in her grocery bills too. And on the grocery bills, there was a segment on one of the bills that had $110 for cat food. $110 for cat food. And the pastor looked at it and said, okay, so you've, you see that you've, you've bought some milk and you've bought this and you've bought... What's this? Is this a mistake? $110? She goes, no, we have 17 cats. <laughs> okay. So the pastor said, we're going to have to streamline <laughs> some things. And there wasn't a whole lot of other things, as I remember anyway, there weren't a whole lot of other things to address. 
And so the pastor said, you know, it's okay maybe to have one or two cats. That would greatly reduce this bill, and I'm sure another bill would have had cat sand on it. Vet bills. The woman would have none of that. I'm not giving up my cats for anything. And, and granted, we have two cats and a dog, and I'm sure a lot of you have pets. They become part of the family, don't they? But a 17-cat family. <laughs> so you see, when people set their priorities wrong, they'll have difficulty, whether it's with cats or with something more serious than cats. You see, our priorities must demonstrate that we are living for the Lord and not living for ourselves. We need to learn to prioritize and then trust the Lord that He will provide. I'll say that again. We need to learn to prioritize our lives and then trust the Lord that He will be our provider. Because you know what? If we do our part and we're faithful and obedient to Him, will He let us down? Look at what happens when we put God first. It says, For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And all of these things will be added to you doesn't say all the things that we want will be added to us. But it does imply all the things that we need will be supplied because He supplies our every need. You ask anyone who has all their priorities in place if they've ever been short of money or time or resources. And they will most likely say, no, nope. God has everything in order because I've put Him first. Note, because God honors and blesses those who put Him first. You ask anyone who sacrifices their finances or sacrifices their time or sacrifices their ego or sacrifices their pride. Ask anyone who sacrifices any of these things in order to put Christ first if they've ever been disappointed with that decision. Oh, I wish I hadn't put God first in this area. I wish I hadn't given money to that project at the church. Oh, I really need it back. I've heard a lot of things from people, a lot of statements. I've never heard that statement before. I've never heard anyone come to me and say, oh, I've been tithing for 20 years and it's just breaking me. I don't know how much longer I can keep this up. I've never heard that. But rather I've heard people who give their time and their efforts and their resources, they say, I wish I could do more. That's honestly the answers that I hear most times. I wish I could do more. I wish I could give more. I'm giving what God requires. I'm giving what God has laid on my heart. I wish I could do more. There's never the opposite. Because God honors and He blesses those who put Him first. Can I get the worship team to come and join me on the platform again? And as they come, I have just this one more slide. I want you to look at it carefully because every one of us needs to apply these questions to our lives, these areas, because I can't determine where your priorities are. I can give advice and you can give me advice, but I can't make the determination of your priorities, nor can you make them of me. And so here are some areas of life that if God is not at the top of this list, then something's wrong. Does he have first place in your relationships? And particularly to young people or individuals who are looking for a spouse or to get married, 
Don't just look for someone who's funny. Don't just look for someone who's attractive. Don't just look for someone who makes you feel good. Look for someone who loves God with all their heart. All their soul. All their mind. All their strength. And if you put God first in your relationships, He will not disappoint you. What about in your job? Your place of occupation? Is it just a place to make money? Or is it a place where you can have a godly influence? You know, I believe God places us in certain areas, in certain places, for a season for His glory. And God may want to use you in your place of work. God may want to use you in your position to have influence. Remember salt and light? And if God is not first place in your job, then things may go wrong. What about in your time? Do you read your Bible? Many times, the Bible is taken and it it gets placed on a table or it gets placed on a nightstand. It gets placed somewhere and is forgotten. And many times, the time spent reading the Word of God, if that is missing, if it's not first place, on your priority list of time, things will go wrong. You've read manuals to different appliances that you have in your house. We were just talking in the office how we have this keyboard that we normally use sometimes and it has this massive manual that goes with it. Lots of reading. Well, in order to get it to work properly or any appliance that you have, you have to read the manual and in order for your life to work properly, The manual has to be read. It cannot fit. Do you go to church only if it fits in with your schedule? These things, reading God's Word and praying and going to church, these need to be so integral in our lives that you just can't do without them. Someone said to me, who missed three weeks of church here just a few weeks ago. And this person said, I just couldn't wait. You know, there was sickness and there was, when the cold weather came, there were difficulties. I just, I I, I couldn't stay away. I just, I had to get back here. Because this is where we, we receive strength and fellowship. This is where we hear God's word. This is where the Holy Spirit speaks to us corporately. And it's not just something that should fit into our schedule. It should be something that's high on our priority list. I've spoken about this already, but the last one we'll say for just a moment. What about your finances? Do you tithe only after you've paid all your bills? Or do you take it right off the top before you even know if you're going to have enough? You see, I believe that we need to give God what belongs to Him. Whether it's our time, our efforts, or our finances. Because it all belongs to Him. When we tithe, when we give offerings, we're not actually giving anything to the church. We're returning to the church what already belongs to Him. It belongs to Him. And so putting God first in our finances will ensure that He will be our provider at all times in our lives. I know someone from years ago and she wasn't even a churchgoer. But she would say this, I give to my local church anyway because I want God to provide for me. Interesting concept, maybe a little bit askew. 
but her heart was in the right place. You see, if Christ is not at the top of each of these categories in life, things will go wrong and and we try to figure out, Lord, why is this happening? And, And maybe it's because He is not at the top. He's somewhere in the middle. Can we stand to our feet for a moment? we bow our heads and close our eyes without anyone looking around because this is a private time between you and God maybe you're here and you would say you know pastor it's not all of these areas you've talked about today but maybe there's one or maybe there's a couple of areas where the Holy Spirit's been speaking to me and and I, I really haven't put him first And today, I'd like to do that. And without anybody looking around, if if you'd like to put God first in an area that the Holy Spirit is speaking to you about, just lift your hand up. I'd like to remember you in prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Once you put it up, you can put it down again. See, because what I believe is that when we put God first, then we place God in a position to unleash every resource that heaven can afford. Through our obedience comes His power. And so Lord, I pray for each hand that has been raised today. And as Your Word by Your Holy Spirit has spoken into our lives, maybe there are some areas that we have not completely given over to You. And so we thank You, Lord, for the, for the folks here and for the children of God and for their honesty and, and just lifting their hand and saying, yeah, I am having a struggle putting God first in a certain area of my life. So, Lord, You've seen their hand and by their hand being raised, Lord, just by Your Spirit, begin to speak to them, strengthen them, and show them how they can put You first. Lord, we live in a dark decaying world. And a lot of the things that You call us to do and the paths that You choose for us or ask us to choose are not the easiest. And they may bring hardship and they may bring pain and they may bring difficulty. But Lord, we are thankful in the cross of Jesus Christ that You provide the strength and the power for whatever it is that we need. As we close the service today, Lord, we're going to sing that chorus again. The cross has the final word. And Lord, may it be the benediction of this time together. Lord, that You would call us to put You first because when You died on the cross, You put us first. So Lord, bless and continue to bless in the days ahead.